By the end of the 19th century, the fundamental ideas of mathematics were beginning to be questioned. People wondered if the maths we built over a millennia of human thought were actually based in truth. In 1874, German mathematician Georg Cantor invented set theory. A set is any well-defined collection of things, each element unique. So there is a set of nothing, the null set, and a set of everything. They can be finite, x, y, z, or infinite, 0, 1, 2, 3, to infinity. Cantor studied one-to-one -one correspondence, such as, say, sets x, y, z, and set a, b, z. x would then correspond to a, y to b, and z to c. If two sets have a perfect one-to-one -one correspondence, then they will be the same size, i.e. they will contain the same number of elements. Two of the sets he studied were the natural numbers and real numbers. Both of these sets clearly have an infinite elements, so before Cantor it should be assumed that they were equally as large, infinitely large. However, Cantor proved that this was not the case. Cantor's diagonalization proof goes like this. First, assume you can match up every natural number with every real number between 0 and 1. If this is true, then they must have a one-to-one -one correspondence, and thus are equal. If you do this and line up all the real numbers top-down, you can create a new number by taking the first decimal of the first real number and adding 1. Make that value of the first decimal place of the new number. Then take the second decimal of the second number and add 1 to it, and repeat infinitely. This number is not in the set of real numbers matched to the natural numbers. It has a different first decimal from the first, a different second decimal from the second, etc. There is now a contradiction, showing that not all infinities are of the same size. This shook mathematics to its very core, and mathematicians began to wonder at the foundations beneath their field. Then, in 1901, British mathematician Bertrand Russell published a fault in Cantor's naive definition of sets. He argued that if sets can contain anything, then they can contain themselves. Now, say, set R contains all sets that don't contain themselves. This is well defined and follows the loose definitions of their theory. If set R doesn't contain itself, then it must be contained in set R. But if set R contains itself, then it can't be contained in set R. This is the paradox of self-reference, and it further split the mathematical community. There were the intuitionists, who believed Cantor's set theory and its multiple infinities were nonsense, and the formalists, who believed math could be logically placed upon the foundations of set theory. Russell was among the intuitionists, and his arguments had marred the utopic promises of set theory. David Hilbert, a formalist, solved this paradox by limiting the definition of sets so that sets cannot contain themselves. That is, self-reference is not allowed. Hilbert believed that mathematical proofs needed to be formalized and systematized based on Cantor sets. Proofs are based on axioms, assumed truthities, and later developed through logic, using existing statements to derive new statements. He developed symbolic language to express axioms. Bertrand Russell and Alfred North Whitehead did just this in 1913 in their Principia Mathematica. They created an exact, exhaustive language of mathematics. Very optimistic about the use of this formalized mathematics. He put forth three queries about the nature of mathematics that he believed this system could prove true. First, is math complete? Does every true statement have a proof? Second, is math consistent? Is it free of contradictions? Third, 
Is it decidable? Is there an algorithm that can always determine whether a statement follows from the axioms? Then, in 1930, the American logician and mathematician Kurt Gödel showed that Hilbert was deeply mistaken. First, he created a set of Gödel numbers for all basic symbols of mathematical logic. In this symbol, Gödel number 6 would equal the value 0. Number 7 would equal the immediate successor of. So the value 2 would be the immediate successor of the immediate successor of zero. Equations can also be constructed using system and can be represented with their own Gödel number. The equation zero equals zero will then be 656 or 656. And to represent that with a Gödel number, you raise successive primes to each of those numbers and take the product. That is, 2 to the power of 6 times 3 to the power of 5 times 5 to the power of 6, or 243 million. To get the equation back, you just do a prime factorization. Each of these equations slash statements are either true or false. And to figure out the truth in us, you use axioms to build into the system. Because any larger statements result in incredibly large numbers, Gödel numbers can be simplified to letters, say A, B, C. Gödel now finds the Gödel number that says, there is no proof for the statement with Gödel number G. The Gödel number of this statement is then G, in and of itself. That is, Gödel number G is improvable. Say G is false, therefore there must exist a proof for G, but then it must have been proven that there is no proof for G. This is a contradiction, ad absurdum, which shows that mathematics is inconsistent. Say G is true. Therefore, there exists a true statement without a proof. That is, mathematics is incomplete. This is Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Any and all systems of mathematics have statements that are true, but have no proof. Gödel's second incompleteness theorem states that in a formal axiomatic system of maths, it is impossible to prove its own consistency. The final nail in the coffin of David Hilbert's dream of a formalized mathematics came in 1936 when British mathematician Alan Turing invented his famous Turing machine. The Turing machine has an input of an infinitely long tape of cells containing either a 1 or a 0. It has a read-write head, covering one cell at a time, and depending on internal instructions and inputs, it can move left, right, over right, or halt. This machine, if given enough time, can execute any programmable algorithm. Turing rephrased Hilbert's third and final query of mathematics, whether it is a decidable. He asked, is it possible to tell whether a program will halt given a particular input? This is his famous halting problem. First, assume there exists such a machine, halts, that prints out halts or never halts given the exported program, an input to a Turing machine. Then modify it. So if it outputs halts, then it goes into an infinite loop and never halt. And if it outputs never halts, then it immediately halts. Call this new machine opposite. Then turn opposite into code and input it as a program and as code into the opposite machine. This is where Turing springs the trap and asks, what will happen? If opposite determines the opposite code will never halt, then opposite immediately halts. If opposite determines the opposite code will halt, then opposite will loop, never halting. Now we have a contradiction, and therefore a machine 
that can determine whether their program will halt, cannot exist. And therefore, mathematics is undecidable. These two mathematicians, Kurt Gödel and Alan Turing, broke mathematics and uncovered the intrinsic flaw deep within mathematics. And these two giants in the modern world died unfairly, unjustly, from prejudice. The paradoxes of self-reference within sets, within logic, and within machines determine that maths is incomplete, that consistency is unknowable, and mathematics is undecidable.